Prodigal is a tough game to explain. I want to describe it as a Zelda-like, but that isn't quite right. I want to call it a life sim, but those aspects serve second. I want to call it a puzzle game, and I think that is probably the most accurate descriptor. The thing about Prodigal is that while it doesn't really excel in any individual areas, it's greater than the sum of its parts. While the individual aspects may not hold up to scrutiny, when taken together, Prodigal is a striking, in-depth, and extremely clever game. Prodigal was developed by an indie company out of Dallas, Texas known as Colorgrave, and in interest of full disclosure, they reached out to me to see if I'd be interested in covering the game in exchange for a key and an in-game NPC made in my likeliness. I made it clear that I was going to give my honest opinion of the game, and as you can tell by my intro, I do have some criticisms. Prodigal is not a perfect game, but it is a deeply compelling one. So what exactly is Prodigal? Well, I think it could be best described as a Game Boy Zelda with some life simulator aspects. The core of the game involves you delving into dungeons to collect MacGuffins like a Zelda game in a room by room style extremely similar to the Game Boy titles like the Oracle games or Link's Awakening. But whereas in Link's Awakening you only return to Koholint to do side quests and visit the shop, the town is much more important in Prodigal. It takes inspiration from life sim games like Harvest Moon or more specifically Rune Factory, and when you are home, you can strike up friendships and even romances with the villagers. So think of it like a Zelda game, but you can actually marry your waifu. I make frequent reference to the Game Boy Zelda games in this review because this game is undoubtedly inspired by them in the best possible ways. Prodigal plays the way we remember the best Game Boy RPGs playing. The color palette and sprite count is purposefully limited in the overworld to give a look that could jump right out of the screen of a Game Boy Color, but this restriction is broken tastefully for occasional on-screen effects and character portraits that look closer to something you might see on a Game Boy Advance game. This doesn't really lead to any sort of conflict of visuals since you know what to expect. Lower bit sprites in the overworld, higher bits for the character portraits. And I gotta say, it works really well. I love how this game looks. The character portraits are lovely and the overworld sprites are charming. The visuals look perfect for the style they're going for. Another high point for Prodigal is the soundtrack. It is absolutely killer, with the overworld theme in particular being a huge highlight. The soundtrack is a fantastic callback to the bit-driven soundtracks of the Game Boy days, but with occasional layers of modern instrumentation coming in over top. It works to create some absolutely magical music, and I will be listening to the soundtrack for Prodigal long after I'm finished with the game. So what about the game? What is the actual gameplay loop? Well, for the most part, Prodigal plays like a 2D Zelda game. You're sent into a dungeon to retrieve a MacGuffin. While you're there, you solve puzzles and then beat a boss. Then you go back into town with that MacGuffin in your inventory to further the plot before being sent out to the next dungeon to gather the next plot item. Pretty straightforward. But the main thing that sets Prodigal apart from a more standard Zelda-like is the social aspect. When you return back to the town of Van's Point from your adventures, there is a wide array of villagers to interact with, each with their own lives and problems. And by visiting these villagers between adventures and helping them solve their problems or just getting to know them, you can raise your friendship level with the villagers and even fall in love and get married to any of the many eligible bachelorettes in Van's Point. So how does it succeed in each aspect and how do the two work together? Well, let's look at the Zelda-like aspect first. I think the absolute best thing that Prodigal has going for it is its sense of mystery. Exploring the overworld in Prodigal is as enjoyable as the very best 2D Zelda games because there are secrets to be found literally everywhere. You just need to look. Bombable walls, a grapple hook to a new area, secret paths. I found an entire dungeon my second time that is totally optional and hidden out of the way. I honestly think that in terms of map design and hidden secrets, Prodigal might actually be a cut above most 2D Zelda games just through the sheer breadth and variety of things to find. So what about the dungeons? They're honestly pretty good. 
Prodigal makes an interesting choice to hugely limit the number of items you get. You get a grappling hook type item, a powerful punch attack, and an item that warps you to whichever entrance you entered the room by. And those are the only three items you get. You get upgrades to them, but you don't get any new items. Just those three. And you get all three of them very early to use over the rest of the game, very similar to the rune powers in Breath of the Wild. But whereas the difficulty of the average puzzle in Breath of the Wild stayed pretty low because they wanted to account for you being able to encounter the puzzles at any point in the game, Prodigal doesn't have to worry about that. So even though every temple relies on these same three items to solve its puzzles, this is actually a big point in its favor because it's constantly developing ideas in a dungeon and then advancing that idea in further dungeons. Nothing in the story dungeons were enough to stump me into looking up a walkthrough, but I definitely did run into a couple head scratchers, and some of the puzzles in the optional content were downright devious. So all in all, I have to say that I'm really happy with the dungeons in Prodigal. If there's an aspect where Prodigal is a bit of a letdown in regards to its Zelda-like qualities, it's definitely in the combat. I didn't find the combat to be particularly fun, honestly. I think a lot of my issues came from the choice of weapon, which is a pickaxe that you find early on. Regardless of the scale of the threat you face, you'll be doing so with your pickaxe, and the biggest problem with it is the hitbox. Whereas in Zelda game, your sword gives off a wide, horizontal sweep that covers the entire area in front of you. A pickaxe is swung vertically, and as a result, you only attack a small point directly in front of you. This means that you have to be a lot more precise in combat, which isn't necessarily a bad thing, but I just don't think that the enemy hitboxes are necessarily up to par for that sort of meticulous collision checking. That, paired with the strict four-directional movement, meant that navigating areas with large amounts of enemies was a lot more frustrating than it was fun. So unfortunately, I don't love the combat. But combat is far from the core of the game, so it wasn't even close to a deal breaker for me. Overall, I thought that the dungeon delving and exploration in Prodigal were excellent. So if the Zelda-like side of it was handled pretty well, how about the social aspect? Well, I have something of a complicated answer. I want to first give praise where I feel it is due. The characters in this game are excellent. Every single one of the bachelors is top waifu material with excellent character designs and compelling personalities. The first time through, I actually agonized over who to marry, which isn't something that happens often in life sim games for me. Usually I immediately gravitate to a girl, Maru in Stardew Valley and Mary in Friends of Mineral Town, but it was a genuinely tough decision for me in Prodigal and that was because of how well written and well designed all the marriage candidates are. I ended up deciding on Lynn because, well, she reminded me of a certain somebody. A lot of attention is paid to some of the non-bachelor characters as well, which I'm pretty grateful for. I've always really hated how non-marriable characters in life sims tend to end up being absolutely empty, hollow characters, so it was really nice to see storylines furthering your relationship with characters like Hugh. Some of the characters were still pretty flat, but there was definitely a lot more effort to flesh out the entire roster of characters than I would say there is in most life sim games. I also really, really loved how you got to watch romances play out with other couples. It gave you a real kick in the pants if you started to see somebody make a move on a person you wanted to marry, and it was really sweet to see the villagers you didn't pick fall in love in their own cutscenes. So when it works, I actually thought the social aspect was fantastic. But I did have an issue with it, and that issue is that I often found it very difficult to engage with the social aspect. Most NPCs that can be easily found have very little new to say, and some are downright difficult to find. It can also be difficult to figure out how to actually advance relationships with people. Sometimes talking to characters will advance the storyline between the two of you, but other times it seems like you have to just wander around and hope to stumble into the cutscene needed to advance the storyline with whatever NPC you're after by entering the right area at the right time. At one point, the sheriff told me that I should rekindle my friendship with his deputy, Hugh, who I apparently used to be very close to. So I took that as meaning that I need to talk to him more, so I specifically sought him out after every dungeon, only to be greeted with repeated dialogue. I took every opportunity I could to talk to him and try and advance that storyline because the sheriff telling me to rekindle that friendship made me think that it was something that I could actively advance. But it didn't matter when or where I talked to him or 
or how often, I couldn't seem to rekindle much of any friendship. It wasn't till later when I inevitably entered the right place at the right time and triggered an event relating to a totally different character that I finally triggered the cutscene with Hugh and was able to advance the storyline. I understand that this is the method that a lot of life sim games use to trigger cutscenes, but it isn't a very good method in those games either. It sort of felt like the sheriff telling me to rekindle my friendship actually sort of sent me on the wrong trail and ended up making me waste a bit of time, when really all I needed to do was wait. It's also a small nitpick, but I really did not like the text engine. It seemed like it could only ever display an extremely limited number of characters at a time, and it led to a lot of instances of a single word taking up its own row, which led to me pressing through it quicker to see new dialogue since a single sentence doesn't take very long to read, only to skip over stuff when all of a sudden two new lines come out at once. Where the Zelda-like aspects and the social aspects come together is in Prodigal's story. And how is that story? Well, I think that the best way to put it is that you will get out of the story what you are willing to put in. Prodigal has a base storyline that will play out no matter what you do, and I think that it's fine. Not anything amazing, but perfectly serviceable, albeit at times confusing. You see, you play as a young man named Oran, returning home after being away for a long time, and the game sort of just thrusts you into the narrative as it's happening without explaining much at all about Oran's past with the village, and leaves you to piece together what happened. You know that his parents are dead, and you also know that before Oran left, he stole something from his parents and lost the respect of most of the village in doing so. And so when you come back, a lot of the townsfolk are upset or downright hostile towards you, sometimes unrelentingly so. And it can honestly be pretty off-putting at the start, since you have absolutely no idea what Oran did to deserve this sort of treatment. It sort of just makes the other characters look unreasonable at first. The truth of the matter is that they are absolutely justified in their anger towards Oran, but a lot of that stuff needs to be pieced together. And I think needs to be pieced together is a good explanation for most of Prodigal's lore and story. Prodigal actually has a really great story and a very rich setting, but you won't know that if you don't go looking for it. It because what this game shows by default barely touches the surface. Most of the backstory is hidden away in relationship scenes, and most of the lore is quite literally hidden away in secret rooms within dungeons. Quite a bit of the character stuff and even some of the story can't even be accessed until your second playthrough, and that's why I say that the story for Prodigal will be as good as the work you're willing to put into it. The bare bones story is fine, but you'll be left with a foggy idea of Oran's past and no idea why the North and South are fighting. However, if you max out every relationship and explore every dungeon to its fullest, you'll get a much better idea and I think you'll be pretty darn pleased with what's there. There's some really good writing. This wouldn't normally be a downside, I have total respect for that sort of hands-off style of game development. But where it becomes a downside is in considering that the game does very little to make you aware that this stuff exists. I understand not highlighting the existence and location of hidden upgrades and bonus items in the overworld, but I think that extending this hands-off style to the story actively harms the experience, because I think a lot of people who finish it will do so not even knowing that any of this further context exists. The only reason I knew to explore dungeons and max out relationships to get more of the story is because I literally had a developer there to tell me as much. If I didn't, I think I probably would have just missed out totally. And that's a total shame because what is hidden away is great. I just wish the game would have done something to signify that it exists. Even just a little prompt at the start telling you that you'd get more of the story by exploring and maxing out friendships, that would have been fine and I bet they probably could have worked something like that into Grandpa's dialogue. I know I've sounded really critical of Prodigal up to now, and that's because I have been, but I just want to take this moment to re-emphasize that I really do think that this is a great game. It's maybe just a game that gets in its own way a little bit. And so, I have a recommendation for you. There is a really excellent fan wiki that has been developed for Prodigal, and it's pretty extensive. And I think that the absolute best way to experience Prodigal is to play it with this wiki open, so when you're confused about something Thing when you're having a hard time finding an NPC, you can just look it up. If you are wanting to learn more about some of the backstory, you can just look it up. 
I don't recommend playing the game through the wiki if you know what I mean. A lot of the strength of Prodigal does come from its mystery, so you should at least put an honest effort into discovering things, but don't miss out on the absolutely fantastic writing and character development that exists in this game because you're having a hard time finding NPCs or can't find a secret room in a dungeon. I played through Prodigal twice. My first playthrough was fine, good even, I enjoyed the game, but it didn't exactly blow my mind. Then I had a chat with a developer and I learned the stuff that I sort of missed, and my second playthrough was excellent. It was fantastic because I knew what to look for, so if you go into this game knowing what to look for, I think you'll have a fantastic experience too. And you might even do a second playthrough, which will be worth it. An aspect of Prodigal that I really appreciate is the effort that went into the post game. Not only is there a lot to do after beating the story, like entire dungeons that you probably missed to find and complete, but the game actually has totally new elements on a second playthrough. Even certain story elements can only be accessed on your second playthrough, which is something that I really appreciate. I honestly think it might be fair to say that Prodigal is at its best in your second playthrough. And like I said, I do believe that Prodigal is worth that second playthrough. I know I've been pretty critical, but when I say that Prodigal was more than the sum of its parts, I really meant it. The combat is flawed, the story can be cryptic, and the social aspect can be frustrating, but the game works overall. When it all comes together, it's entrancing, sometimes even spellbinding. Prodigal is a flawed game, but it's still a very good one. And considering Prodigal is Colorgrave's first game, I think that's a pretty incredible first outing. If I had to give Prodigal a rating, I'd probably give it a 4 out of 5. It has some very real flaws, but everything around those flaws is just so good that they sort of fall into the background. Great job, Colorgrave. Thanks again for watching. If you want to check Prodigal out, I have a link to it in the description. Thanks again to Colorgrave for reaching out to me, providing me with a key, and keep an eye out for a certain hooded figure appearing in-game in the future. As always, stay safe out there. Whatever you do, make sure to keep your eyes open for a maniac with a shovel, because out in Van's Point, it's dangerous to go alone.